and go, go. Oh, I'm sorry. I was in Jamaica for a second there. I went on vacation. It's been a long time. It's Sunday. <laughs> and from Ybor City, from 1714 West 7th Street, in Great Ybor City, where it all began, it's time to jump into the rotation. No jumping required, though. No. Just, yes. just cue the, uh, the, you know, the thing. Ah, jeez. I'm all over the place. Uh, okay, hold on. There you go. See that how easy that was? Don't lie, man. That totally you did that. You didn't do that on purpose. Of course not. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it threw me off. <sighs> but it's okay. We've never had a perfect show. That's what's great about the rotation. Is that there's never one similar rotation. We just keep on going. We are perfectly improving. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you gonna, you gonna introduce us, Gary? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, this is Gary, your, your political director of Suncoast Normal. It's been a long night. I think it's, I think it's morning, though. And uh, this is my co host, my, our assistant director, Carlos Armida, and for calling us from just above the Beltway, our executive director, Chris Kano. Hi, Kena. Hey, team. Uh, how we doing? And our guest of honor in round two <laughs> is Dr. Jeffrey Block. And uh, we are going to be talking about the history of, of cannabis and how it has affected us and where, where we're going from there, where we're going now, and how it all started. Yeah, we had uh, Dr. Block on the show two weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, we got some great reviews from the show. Got to yep. say that. And unfortunately, I didn't get that much time to hang out with you during that show. So uh, I'm here. I'm going to spend the entire time with you. And I'm interested to hear, like, honestly, I, it, it's nice to hear that you've coordinated with Kano a little bit about the history because that guy knows a lot about the history about of cannabis. And I'm sure you know a whole heck of a lot that he doesn't. So this is going to be a real interesting show for me. Yeah, I want you to fill in the gaps. And I've yeah. got a lot of gaps. Yeah. Especially this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, before we get going, though, Chris, is there anything special coming up in Washington, D.C. right now we should know about? Um, well, let's see. Special. Hmm. Nothing. That's the that's what's special about it is that, you know, we've been pushing so hard and hoping that we were going to get something legislatively this year. It doesn't look like we're going to get any passage this year on on any of our cannabis bills. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, President Biden's big, you know, build back better plan is something that's going for a vote. And uh, don't even not even sure if they're going to be able to pass that uh, in Congress. Uh, as, I, as as far as the debt ceiling goes, they've uh, kicked things down the road to February. So all in all, Congress is at its status quo, doing absolutely nothing to move the ball forward. And the Safe Act was was officially removed from the National Defense Spending Act. Yep, yep. If anything, we're not moving forward, and that's that's just uh, you know a little bit heartbreaking. But you know, uh, someone told me, don't make politicians your heroes; you'll always be disappointed. <laughs> Generally, and we had we had talked in the spring that we, we would have gotten the more act up for a vote, possibly as far as late as November, but it really never got that far, did it? No, I mean, you know, and, and that's something that, that really irritates me. And you know, and on top of it, at National Normal, there's been some turnover in staff, so we're losing some really great folks who have been there on the ground in the trenches, uh, pushing things forward. So, um, you know, what uh, the 2022 is going to hold is uh we'll see i mean let's put it like this the midterm elections are coming up and i fully plan for our chapter to take a look at every single member of the florida delegation in congress and encourage the florida voters that if, if your member of congress is not just is is in favor of prohibition but also folks who are sitting on their hands and not doing anything we need to be electing people who are going to move the ball forward when it comes to ending prohibition, not just continue to smile at us and wave and, and say, oh, we'll get it done. We'll get it done. And we want people to take action and actually get it done. Chris, may I ask you a question about Suncoast Normal? Yeah, uh, absolutely, Doc. As Gary just said, you're up towards Washington now in D.C., but you're the director here, Suncoast. For those of you not that familiar with Florida, you're talking about generally Midwest coast of Florida. And, and yet we've got um, several normal chapters in the state of Florida. And since these are individual state experiments, in essence, leading to federal changes in the not too distant future, you'd hope. Uh, tell me about the differences of opinion membership and otherwise representation of Florida's different normal chapters. 
Oh, that's a great question. Question. Very, very nice question. <laughs> very astute. <laughs> well, you know, uh, for all of our listeners who are at home, you yourself can start a normal chapter. Uh, what you need to do is, is get a few friends together, become members of National Normal, uh, write up some bylaws, uh, you know, uh, get, get you some officers, host some elections, and, and, and open up a bank account, essentially, you know, and run your own nonprofit. In Florida, we have several different chapters. Um, we have a, a, a Magic City Normal down in Miami. Uh, we also have um, Normal of Tallahassee. We have Orlando Normal. Uh, the folks in Jacksonville and Duval, they've had chapters on and off uh, for the past, uh, you know, uh, six, seven years. It's, it's sometimes, again, the, running a normal chapter is a full-time thing. It's, it's difficult at times. Uh, Carlos, Gary, myself, we put in a lot of hours each and every week to make this happen and not take a paycheck for it. And for some folks, uh, that luxury in life just doesn't exist where, the, you know, th their income is is part of their survival. And and so that's that can be difficult. But the fact is that anybody can start a normal chapter if they're willing to step up and become activists. And then, of course, we have Normal of Florida, uh, which is run by Karen Goldstein, uh, um, you know, down in a uh, Brown uh, Broward Palm Beach County area, and uh, you know, and, and Karen, um, you know, uh, has structured uh, the Normal of Florida chapter to be a more of a, an educational charity, uh, trying to get the word out and educating folks. Where with us at Suncoast Normal, we're a five hundred one c four, not a five hundred one c three. We're not a charity. Uh, we're a membership based, you know, social activist organization. Uh, no different than the NAACP or the League of United Latin American Citizens. At our core, I've always felt as though we are a civil rights organization fighting for the civil rights of medical marijuana patients and responsible users. And Dr. Block, you had mentioned earlier that 1971 was not only the, the time that prohibition got the biggest step up with the Controlled Substance Act, but it also birthed normal as well. You know, uh, actually the year is just because it's convenient math too. I think it was 1970 to 2020. And 2020 is a year I'd like to erase from my memory. But <laughs> nevertheless, those 50 years were formative because they arrived with both normal and the Controlled Substances Act, which now sort of redefined where cannabis was legally. But but it, it's sort of original prohibition goes back to the 1930s, doesn't it? Or at least you would think from a federal point of view, because the things that Chris is pointing out right now about the federal movements uh, afoot to basically end federal prohibition didn't go into federal prohibition instantly overnight either. It was a process. and And so I thought one of the curious things we could do is take ourselves away from Florida, our maybe Southeast United States mentality a minute, and shift back closer to well, a little over a century ago to attitudes elsewhere, in this case in the United States, about not simply cannabis, but about medical, nope, not at all, marijuana. And that's not just a, a Spanish word. It actually is a Mexican-derived word, Mary Jane as a sort. So while that's slang and it carries certain connotations uh, that are not necessarily favorable, we talk about it in terms of cannabis, okay? So that that's the Latin scientific name for the plant. And for anybody really interested in what its real name is, that's it. But let's talk about it as I marijuana. couldn't agree with you more, Dr. Pock. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's talk it's about it It's a racist it word. <laughs> yeah, so, so tell me if, uh, if there's one individual that's associated with that word that would come to mind that eventually led up to prohibition. Who would you think that person is? Is it my Harry Anslinger? Keep going. You're in the right decades, but not even the right decades. But t tell them who Anslinger is a minute, Gary. He was the, he was the first uh, commissioner of the uh, Department of uh, Narcotics in, the, in Washington, D.C., which was actually an offshoot of the uh, Office of Prohibition. When prohibition ended, they looked for something else to uh, prohibit, and they they, they uh, sent some letters out to the AMA. And they asked them what was, what is the biggest problem out there as far as uh, abusive drug, and they came up with uh, with cannabis. Uh, actually, he only got one letter out of the twenty that he got there, but he decided he was going to go with that. And All right. So, so what year? Forward. What years would that be? That would have been uh, like 1934, 1935. Right. Then he went started going from state to state to get uh, state laws passed. And then there was also concern for attitudes about it that lent itself to federal government and and strong leadership, in particular in law enforcement, Hoover. But in, in the meantime, the person who I'm thinking about associated with the marijuana is not Anslinger, 
nor is it Hoover. And it actually predates that by nearly a quarter century. So here's my point. How about if I asked you the question of the 50 United States, and mind you, back a century ago, there weren't even 50, but of the United States, which was the first state to enforce prohibition against, in this case, marijuana? Utah. Mm, Utah is, is early, but as far as a disposition that really lent the trend, think about how few people were in Utah, and what's more, Think about where Utah's borders are to the south. And the actual answer is California. And oh, California, whoa. closer to 1910-11, enacted their first laws against marijuana. But why? And, and the person whose name I was asking for, if you might think of associated with prohibition, that derives the Mexican word, maybe in fact a guy named Pancho Villa. You remember the name Pancho oh, Villa? Ooh. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Pancho Villa came up from where Mexico is, but he was not the Mexican government. This is after other wars, land changed back and forth. And essentially, he was a vigilante coming in and trying to take back what is now American land and Americans perished in it. So if you think about it in that way, an invasion on American soil, at least as we understand where our property is within the contiguous United States, it may in fact be the first terrorist attack, not the World Trade Center, but over a century before. So if that sort of defines what we think about foreigners, terrorists, and, and threats from outside of our borders, think about cannabis prohibition maybe in that context, because yes, California had later players who closer to the 1930s would have been involved, including people like William Randolph Hearst. And that had nothing to do with marijuana, everything to do with hemp. It's a source of paper. <laughs> and he owns forests of trees designed to publish and make newspapers. So there were many people from industry, from perhaps vigilante groups coming in representing threats, as well as that you had even Big Pharma back then. And a company that was around in the you know middle to later 1800s, highly profitable out of Germany, Bayer. And they're still around today, B-A-E-Y-E-R, the aspirin people. And back in the 1870s, Bayer put for market their new drug that was non-addicting and, and would be a good replacement for morphine, and that was called heroin, legal drug here, 1874 to the latest 1800s. When it finally came out a quarter century later, it was actually more addicting and, and had big problems associated with it. But as far as big pharma, industry for paper, uh, threats coming from the South, these are all events that are happening that you can think of as being, first and foremost, a California initiative. So in fact, California is the way I think about prohibition back in the earliest 1900s, say 1910, 11, leading up to 1937. So those 26, 27 years in between, there was a process that went across the United States that that latched on to that same kind of sentiment about marijuana to vilify it, not so much because of its realities, but because of its associations. And that goes on today. So it wasn't simply marijuana coming up from Mexico. You had all since the starting of the Atlantic Pacific Railroad, a lot of people derived from came, came over from Asia to build that. And along with it through Northern California, more closer to think of San Francisco today, the opium trade. Okay, that drug was flourishing in from Asia. Drugs coming from the South, at least cannabis from, from there. The mentality was in those days, and think of it in context of the last several years, let's close our borders to foreigners and their evil drugs and influences. So it's nothing new what's been going on in, in recent history. You can go back over a century and see that same sentiment, but maybe deservedly so, because you had a world war in the 30s developing potential over on the Europe side. Asian side brings in, in Japan and with the consequences of that invasion took. So finally, those were sentinel events leading up to the big war. Uh, World War II. And I'm saying that the years that led up to not only World War II, but cannabis prohibition right around the same time had associated fear of foreign influences that brought along with it 
drugs and human behavior. And I, I wanted to share that with you because that was a process of 26 years going into prohibition. So now I'm going to take you on the other side, the outside of it. When do you think medical cannabis in a concept started coming out of prohibition and which was the first state to enact legal medical cannabis as perhaps a new path for the rest of the country? What state do you think that was? You know, originally the, the, the California law in 1996. Yeah. There you go. California again, yeah. starting a West flows East trend. And it was 1996. Here's the next big question, and this is more science-based. Why 1996? Why did it take from 1970 to 1996, those 26 years, for that to happen? The discovery of the endocannabinoid system in uh, 94, right? Bravo. Bravo, Chris. Exactly. So now you knew not just suspicion that it may work. You knew how it worked. Once you know the mechanism of how a certain medicine works, then you can actually start to legitimately research it and work with it as a tool. It's one of the reasons I try not to give dispositions about psychedelics, mushrooms and the sort, because we really still don't know how it works. We know that it can, but it's much more tangible to know how something works to be able to really derive the potential benefits from it and know what you're working with in the first place. So you're right. California, upon the discovery of the body's own system that cannabis in some ways mimics, was the important medical discovery that led medical cannabis on the path to what hopefully someday ends prohibition. That's not necessarily adult use in a theme of free the weed and everybody's rights or decriminalize uh, or even the way normal today defines legalization. But nonetheless, it, it defined a medical path. And so here's the interesting thing. 1970 to 96, roughly a quarter century, 96 till now, another quarter century. Where have we evolved in terms of our understanding and acceptance of it with the realization that by the mid-90s, we actually knew how it worked now. And, and that's where I thought we could go into a little bit of a political discussion about who we regard as the nation's top doc. The top, the top public health official in the United States and those states that have surgeon generals, there's the key word, are who we have in, in positions of, of government that are their charge and responsible for guiding medical interests in the interest of public health. So may I share a slide with you about dispositions of surgeon generals in the United States over the last 50 years? I put this together a few years ago, so it, it does not have the current administration, but it, can you share my slide, my screen now, or do I have to press something? We're looking right at it. We're yeah, it's up right on the screen it. now, Doc. Good. Okay, so full screen here, and, and I know there's a lot of little print there, so don't bother with the little print. But this represents those 50 years, and it's the reason I like saying 1970, which you can cite certain things that that really is when the Controlled Substance Act happens, the final versions maybe not. But in fact, the very first Surgeon General of the United States at that point appointed by President Nixon actually was in favor of it. You see Jesse Steinfeld, there, pro, number one uh, in the top left corner there. And by the way, the numbers, if you can see in a color screen there, the numbers represent either green means pro, red means con, and blue means not clearly pro or con, as you see directly below with the second Surgeon General under President Carter, uh, Julius Richmond, wasn't clearly pro or con. Uh, then we had perhaps one of the more um, significant Surgeon Generals in the United States in the last 50 years, C. Everett Koop, who personally, as a, a as a advocate for public health and someone who recognized the perils of tobacco, probably did more for public health awareness and to start to curtail the, the scourge of tobacco use, abuse, and the addiction associated with it and illnesses. So in fact, he was staunchly opposed, but that sort of would make sense because of, of the way cannabis is smoked. Then you've got other Surgeon Generals, but the last, look at the last 20 years there you from go. the the columns on the right from 2002 right up till this next year truly 20 years of four consecutive surgeon generals 
under four presidents, a fifth now, which is actually Vitek Murthy, who again is Surgeon General as he was under President Obama, all of which are regarded as not having a clearly pro or con attitude for it. So any leadership from the nation's top doc has been poorly defined at best and sort of also represents that the Surgeon Generals, not only in the United States, but here in Florida, are appointees. They're not elected officials. They're appointees from the administration that's in charge during that time. And, and that's important because their voice may not be as entirely uh, scientific and, and based on things. They, they can be politicized, as, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, not just issues concerning cannabis, but we can look at COVID as well uh, for what happens when politics and, and politics gets in the way of medicine. So um, of note is then the current Surgeon General, which would be number 11 on that list, is again Vivek Murthy. Um, he happens to be from down here in Miami. Uh, his parents are also physicians, and he was the valedictorian of my high school, the one I went to uh, after I graduated. He's, he's younger than I am, but he's a dedicated public health official, so you do see him with respect in particular of COVID recently but uh, not so much lately anything concerning cannabis on the federal front. Isn't that right, Chris? So um, I wanted to bring up the history of, of the Surgeon Generals because they are the people that we look up to as the nation's top doc. Now, I, I, I should mention that Jocelyn Elders uh, was probably one of the most outspoken Surgeon Generals we'd had in our time, and she actually had no filter as far as I could, say, I could tell. I had a chance to meet her, and she, she spoke on a number of topics that people didn't want to talk about. I'm wondering if some of those people actually did have opinions, but unlike Dr. Elders, they didn't want to talk about it because it was politically unfavorable. I think that there's a strong possibility of that, as you see from current issues that have nothing to do with cannabis today. On, um, they are spokespersons for the uh, administration that appoints them to that position, and they dutifully serve. Remember, it's it's really Surgeon General. This has a military obligation in terms of leadership, and they follow the lead of who appoints them, which is usually the president or, in this case, the governor of, of our state. So um, they're highly respected and usually talented doctors who uh, generally are dedicated public health officials career-wise. Uh, it gives them a different background. Um, right now, I can tell you out of the University of Miami, not only do we graduate for the last dozen or more years, 200 new doctors with MD degrees, but about 50 of them, about one in every four, have a dual degree when they graduate of their master's in public health. And, and that's a rather important understanding of what talents and skills a doctor coming out in 2022 should have a knowledge of to make these hard and thorny decisions about what's in the interest of public health as measured against an individual's rights. So I'd like to show one more slide. Now, not about the Surgeon Generals, but about how confusing it must be for these Surgeon Generals to keep up with the plant. Because the plant that Jesse Steinfeld, the first Surgeon General in 1970, was looking at is not the same plant that Jerome Adams under Donald Trump was looking at. And I wanted to show you the same 50 years for how the plant has changed a moment. May I show another slide? Yeah, go ahead, Doc. Go ahead. Good. One second. Oh, sorry. How about, can oh. you see this? There we go. There we go. Sorry. I had technical difficulties. No, All right. Getting seasick just looking uh, at it. <laughs> Yeah, this, this this is a dizzying slide with a lot in it. But here's this is normally a slide that I um, produce on what's called Keynote, okay? And I don't know why this little buzzing thing's here. But nevertheless, I wanted to show you this with respect to, and I'm going to stop moving my cursor. It's annoying. Um, there's a timeline on the bottom. In the middle bottom in green, it says before 1970. You see that? Uh, Are you yeah, with me? Yeah. OK, good. That, that's our starting point. And everything in the green there refers to the plant the first Surgeon General in 1970 would have seen. And they would have seen then that, as it says on the bottom, the cannabis cultivars had evolved 
up to that point, at least in certain places in the world, where it was pretty obvious that the plant had a balance that was nowhere near as concentrated. And that's where the lines on the left, the, the markings on the left, represent sequential increases of how potent a given varietal is. So 0% on the left, 5%, 10%, we're talking THC now, 15, 20, 25, and so on. So back then, that green curve shows that plants barely, and maybe once in a while, reached at most 5% total THC, but that CBD, which is in blue curves and THC in red, um, would have had about comparable amounts potentially then. And that balance of how the plant evolved, maybe over thousands of years, was something that seemed to have at least the efficacy for medical purposes that kept it being used by human beings for those thousands of years. The changes in the plant, though, that happened from that 1970 central point there, if you go to the left, it brings you up to the modern cannabis plant's THC balance or unbalance. And to the right, for hemp, it's CBD. My point is that even with the concentrated flower forms that are out there today, yielding either THC or CBD, neither ones of those particular plants are balanced. They all are meant to feature that particular chemical. So that's where the plants have evolved to today. As a matter of fact, Try to find a plant that has 25% THC and CBD and you won't find it. Try to find one that has 15% of each and you won't find it either. So it's possible to do that and breed them in the plants. These plants started differently, but the factors that to find. prohibition forces the plant to are things that promote concentrates, don't they? And, and you can think of concentrates that way in the same context of the prohibition of alcohol. I think we may have touched on this because alcohol prohibition, again, going back shortly before the 1937s, but in the 1920s, alcohol was not known for weaker forms of, of alcohol, such as beer and wine. Everything was about spirits, 40% alcohol, if you want to go to percentages, or moonshine, sometimes yeah. much more than 40%. So the constraints of prohibition for alcohol and cannabis in some ways are identical because they encourage, if you're gonna take a risk and it's illegal, why not take the risk on something that's concentrated versus not concentrated or impotent because the penalties are gonna be the same and they're based on weight, how much you get caught with. So um, my point here is that the genetics of the plant that allowed THC to evolve to 25%, you can trace back to around the same year, 1970, 71, where in Kandahar, Afghanistan, you had Afghani Kush and then skunk number one, have certain traits that encourage the increase of that THC and also myrcene, but much more than the CBD. And then you had other varietals discovered slightly later that now have pushed CBD in certain hemp plants to have quite impressive amounts of CBD. But again, by itself, at least from what we know, those patients in particular, some kids with refractory epilepsy who get CBD, a whiff, a tiny little bit of THC seems to cover better those refractory seizures. So there's a lot in this slide, but if you really want to know what it comes down to for a summary opinion of 50 years, it's the top, the top name of the slide, that the unbalanced modern plant didn't evolve. In my opinion, as a plant guy and a doc looking at the chemistry, they devolved from certain traditionally balanced plants, but that's what's out there today in the stores. Um, so is this a function of, of uh, genetic function or is it a function uh, of uh, genetic selection? Both, okay? It's not genetic selection, it's natural selection if you wanna say who's breeding it. Human beings are breeding this. So natural selection and evolution, not only simply over evolution over 50 years, but in this case, the forces of prohibition selecting year after year after year those things which give more and more potency a better buzz if you're going to look at it that way mm. um, from the thc really again the the principal psychoactive molecule in the plant are things that select over time those that are more concentrated and so while you may have been able to find certain varietals that represented those maybe lower concentrations but better balances and likely more robust or different balances of terpenes as well. You probably 
could track down some seeds back then. As a matter of fact, you had people who went back to Vietnam and back to, to Southeast Asia searching for things like yellow tie stick and those things that perhaps were finally remembered and largely not being able to find them again when they went back. They had been lost, okay? And, and wars help that maybe, but so does maybe not so natural. Maybe it's an I, unnatural selection, Gary. Yeah. I, 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 that's what I'm thinking. I got a few questions for you. We haven't got CRISPR involved yet, though. That's the for, next step in there. First, that's first cool. thing I, I, I want to say, though, is uh, when I was working in California uh, in like t around 2011, uh, you could find some 50 50 strains. Those, those strains are not like really around anymore. They're definitely not, you know, interesting to, to, you know, the customers at most dispensaries. But, um, but I, I did see a lot, like when I was, when I was helping patients with, with medical cannabis out in Cali, I did see a lot of people like using canatonic and Harlequin get much more medicinal benefits from a 50 50 strain. So I do agree with you. I just have two questions. Your first slide. Right. Um, I'm going to the... take the slide down now. Okay. So you want to put oh. my camera? Let's just okay, take yeah. it back. Thanks. So the first slide uh, had uh, different surgeon generals. And um, I understand that you're saying that there's part of the reason why they wouldn't take a stance is because of the confusion between, you know, levels of THC and CBD. Um, but you also talked about the, uh, the, some of them would have political motivations for taking a stance or not taking a stance. What would the political motivations for taking a stance against cannabis be? And my second question has to do more so with like the evolution of the plant. And, um, you know, that last slide that you had up with the two going, you know, two CBD and THC curves going that way, the V shape. Right. Why didn't it even out when medical cannabis became more legalized? Why wasn't that more of a thing? You know, I would imagine as medical cannabis uh, becomes more and more of a thing, you know, uh, more patients would see the, the benefits of those strains and, you know, gravitate towards them. So those uh, are my questions. <laughs> those are a lot of uh, several questions. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so repeat the first one for me a second, Carlos. Uh, what are the political motivations for okay. a Surgeon uh, General taking a stance against cannabis? Who gives you your job? Oh. Period. Period. Okay. Okay. <laughs> They're political appointees, and they may be talented individuals, but uh, their their voice is meant not to conflict with the boss and. In that sense, it depends on how the boss regards the public health officials' knowledge and interest in protecting the public health. Mm -hmm. So, and that sort of leads to the discussion for the second questions because these are not simply issues of individuals' rights. They're individual. They're questions of public health. And when you look at the Surgeon General's progression realize that the thing I mentioned before that ties to that second slide about the potency changing is a very important conversation that you shouldn't speak right past. And here's why. If you look at when states started to adopt qualifying conditions for medical cannabis and how it started to be a grab bag, oh, well, this, this helps, so that helps, and we'll add this in because another state has it, it wasn't based on evaluating that particular condition the way it was tested and researched. It was simply based on letting, let's get one more qualifying condition because that is something that represents more market share potential. So that's the commercialization of it from an industry's perspective that may not always agree with what's truly known about if it does help something medically. At the same time that these last decades have been going on now with states coming aboard with medical programs since 1996, you have whatever standards a given state might have adopted now changing real time because the plant, the medicine itself is changing real time. And it's much more concentrated than it was before. That represents a huge confounder for confidence if it's going to work or not. And it's because of the issues of potency. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it bluntly because potency matters. Um, anesthesiologists are clinical pharmacists and physiologists. We said this in the first episode. 
And so I can't get past my pharmacy background and understanding. Gary, you said you have understanding and background pharmacy as well. So if we talk about potency for a moment, I'm going to uh, not need to change my slide, but I want to bring back just an article. I, it's a blog point I wrote for something. Um, I'm, I'm writing a blog now, and, and I'm going to share it with you in case people are interested to pull it up. There is an educational resource out of Harvard called The Answer Page. Um, it's basically headed, the editors are also colleagues of mine, but they're up there at Brigham and Women's. They're anesthesiologists, actually. They have some brilliant fellows who work coming through their program who do a lot of research. So their content is up to date, it's extensive, and it's peer reviewed. So for CME or Continuing Medical Education, Higher Standards of Education, there are a few sites that are equal, but they wanted more spontaneous opinions on subjects. So last month they released a blog and I'm happy to tell you that I was one of two people selected for blogs. Um, I submitted mine about two or three weeks ago and it was published uh, and they told me, oh, you'll be in good company. It's being submitted, uh, my blog, and it'll be featured along with the only other person who they were waiting for his blog to come in, and that's Raphael Meshulam, the nice. professor at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who is regarded widely as the father of this whole science. So um, Rafa submitted his blog content about a week before mine. So they quickly launched the blog because you don't hold information that you've written that's hot off the press for even a week when the contributor's 90 plus years old, okay? Yeah. so. He, he was published first a few weeks ago, and I've met with him a few times over here and there, actually at Harvard too. But um, I'm privileged to be on a blog. Our content is different, but it, it extends beyond normal uh, purviews about a new research paper or things. It, it's meant to be perhaps from 30,000 feet as we look at it. And he looks at things going past and present and future as a very knowledgeable, well-spoken, and particularly well-written professor. Um, nevertheless, he's 90, 91 years old now, and uh, I value any opportunity to share a stage, even virtual. So the potency issue, though, getting back to where- oh, sorry, where, can, where can we access the blog? Because now, now oh, I have to read it before I go to bed tonight. Theanswerpage.com. Uh, while you may have to give your email address, you don't have to pay for anything. The blog is free. Uh, also within that website, they published uh, on under their free resources section a 30-minute talk I, I was asked to prepare last year on COVID and cannabinoids that was prepared for the American Osteopathic Association's annual meeting and had 5,000 people online listening to it a year ago, October. So while it's not particularly current to this month or year, everything that I say in that talk is still current. And uh, people who are curious about COVID in particular and THC should look at it simply because we don't know about THC in particular with COVID, but that talk was limited to other viruses for what limited information we have about THC and the body's impact on viruses while THC is on board. It was not particularly favorable. It's probably not a good idea to take up smoking or vaping when we have now this Omicron varietal that now seems to be making a resurgence, at least during the holiday season. So um, in terms of that balancing out COVID and cannabinoids, meaning the body's own, um, it actually gives us a great opportunity to seriously research perhaps CBD. Why? Because some of the things that CBD has going for it as it relates to inflammation and anxiety. Don't think of this as being something where I'm saying acute COVID. No, I'm talking about all of long haulers that are out there that may suffer certain issues associated with anxiety and residual inflammatory processes. It would be a, a, a welcome opportunity to more thoroughly check the benefits versus the drawbacks of CBD in a controlled way because there's so many potential people who might want to participate in some research on that. So, Is there, um, is there any research that might affect the cytokine storm at all, CBD? Uh, acutely, there are, but 
basically you'd have to understand then that when you have an inflammatory process, the, the cytokine, well, let's, let's give your listeners a little understanding, you know, the pictures, Sorry, back of, up. <laughs> you know, the pictures of, of the COVID virus that show those little spikes coming out from all over it, like a Nerf ball with spikes on there. Um, those little projections in a very layman's terms are meant to represent points where it could really irritate where these tiny microscopic viruses are up against blood cells inside blood vessels, uh, different organ systems. There's responses that our bodies give to those particular what are called antigens, these cytokines that produce the storm that they call cytokine storm that makes people sick. That's what makes people really sick with this, not a normal little common cold. So yeah, th this particular types of viruses, okay, coronaviruses, have been around for years, but nowhere near as contagious as Delta, much less the new form now that's coming out now. So um, in fact, the concern is how many people may get it. The good news is the vaccines do work, people. <laughs> and, and so you want to give yourself the best protection for it and minimize the risk not only to you, but those you're around, especially with how fast it, it spreads. Remember, you may not even know you have it and spread it to someone else inadvertently. What is inadvertently? It doesn't mean accidentally. Inadvertent means without thought. Ask an attorney under deposition the difference between accidental and inadvertent, and they'll pull that on you all the time. Inadvertent means without thought. I'd like to think we do things with thought. And so in this case, vaccines are helpful for all of these varietals, in particular boosters, and the timely administration of them seem to be your best defense. So that cytokine storm, Gary, to get back to what's actually happening, while there are things that contribute to it through CBD and anti-inflammatory, remember, cannabinoids have impact on your body's own endogenous cortisol your body's anti-inflammatories that, that are released. When you take prednisone and other types of things that are qualitatively different than what are called NSAIDs or non-steroidal type things like Advil, your body then uses these. They come from adrenal glands and they are meant to have the fine point of mitigating the impact of how caustic, how irritating these spike glycoproteins are to creating that storm against what happens when you don't have any protection from this finely balanced immune system response. You know what happens when you don't have immune system responses to things? Not only do you get sick, what about when you have too much of an immune system response to something? Autoimmune. Yeah, something like lupus, auto yeah. Or auto RA. Illnesses. Some people even thought for a while that maybe that's one of the contributing things to hyperemesis syndrome, even though it may be a little more complicated than that. Nevertheless, the body finds a balance between not too much and not too little response from the immune system. Guess what defines that balance of how the immune system works? Cannabinoids and cannabinoid receptors. That's where the issue of understanding truly what the body's own system is trying to do. And if you are going to impact it by giving essentially a sledgehammer of THC compared to the way the body is so fine-tuned in terms of the, the way the body's own cannabinoids work, be ready because there are likely going to be side effects that may or may not be appropriate for COVID or an immune system response. So the bottom line to your answer to your question about not just spike glycoproteins, but the you know storm that comes when you get the bad response from COVID Nobody knows, but it does have a need for a healthy immune system. If you're going to ask me what's your best defense against it in 2022 coming up, if you don't take extra vitamin D3, do. About 2,000 units a day is fine. It's cheap, a tiny little gel tab. You need that to keep your immune system tuned up. And especially because of the conversion of vitamin D from sunlight and all the stuff we lather over our skin, the indoor time we spend compared to being outdoors in healthy Florida sunshine, sun coast normal. I'm bringing this up. We don't spend enough time in the sun. So your immune system, we are a nation of chronically depleted vitamin D3. Um, re remember that that'll probably have more impact on how you respond to that cytokine storm than someone who's smoking pot.
But how do you respond to people who say that we have a normal homeostasis and that should sustain us against COVID, whereas when we, when we mess with that homeostasis, automatically we, are, we, we, we become vulnerable? <laughs> um, I've gotten that question, actually. Yeah. Uh, my, my comment is one size doesn't fit all. Yeah. Okay. And, and so that happens with the way that cannabinoids impact, I mean, in this case, phyto or plant-based cannabinoids impact the body's own endogenous system. Um, they do so in ways that are far longer acting, have associated imbalances imparted to compared to the way the body system normally imparts balance. If you want to keep a healthy body's own cannabinoid system, give it the building blocks that you need in order to produce those lipid molecules. When I say lipid, I mean fat. Cannabinoids are lipids, okay, the receptors. The whole environment that these nerve endings are lipids. You know about your, your healthy attitudes, eating salmon and all those rich types of, of oils that are good for you, the good ones, not the saturated fats, okay? So those kinds of good body, healthy eating. The fact that if you're not well hydrated, as your body gets sick, and starts to try to fight the virus by putting up a fever. And the fever in these illnesses can be pretty dramatic. Look at the weight loss that some people suffer as a result of being sick, how devastating it is. It's asking your bodies to go into overdrive in an effort that your body's immune system is essentially trying, in a sense, to cook the virus. <laughs> or, or it, it does that. So it takes a lot of extra fluid. Nutrition, sure, calories is one thing. But no water, game over. And so you have to stay very well hydrated before, during, and after getting COVID or any illness for that matter. Water heals. Your tissues, after they get damaged from any illness or injury, will heal better if someone is maintaining good hydration compared to not. So between hydration, vitamin D3, how about rest? Okay, we burn it at both ends. We become a 24-hour day culture, even though our genetics say that we are not supposed to be nocturnal. When you get up in the morning, you're supposed to eat a breakfast, breaking your fast, because you actually may not have eaten since the day before at that time. This is how we're genetically wired. So at least staying hydrated throughout the day. You want to get a good night's sleep, get ready for your day, get tuned up, get the healthy protein, the building blocks that you need to get in there. And so what we eat, what we drink, how much we sleep, how much rest we get, okay, from, from there, rest can be different than sleep too, allows your body to build up the defenses that are far more powerful to complement your immune system through your body's own healthy cannabinoids than cannabis itself probably ever thought of being. But it's pretty cool that a plant would evolve chemicals that interact with this particular receptor system. When I say one size fits all, it's because when people use it, the body's fooled into thinking that those receptors that we have are being occupied. They don't know if it's natural or unnatural for the receptors. So the body tends to make less receptors. There are receptors being made and dying off all the time, but hopefully in balance so that as time goes by, when someone is what's called downregulated because they're using cannabis frequently, they're not producing as many new receptors. And so they may get high, you know, easily, but won't be able to sustain that. There's a concept of, in, in pain management called a drug holiday. A drug holiday is meant to not have those receptors engaged with chemicals for a certain period of time. And only a few weeks is all that's needed. And then when exposed to baby doses, will have tremendous impact, again, as though they were trying it the first time. So- You hear that, Carlos? Baby doses, not fat dabs for your friends who have been in rehab for a whole year. So, it's like, hey, yeah, from, from what Dr. Block is saying, I'm very happy that I take more CBD. <laughs> um, so, but, Doc, funny story. Um, I, I, <laughs> when when uh, I was arrested um, for treating my dad, 
um, I was court ordered to rehab. And so, you know, I, after having been a smoker since age 21 and having to all of a sudden take a mandatory, you know, a tolerance break, as you said, a, a drug holiday, you know, under court order, uh, Carlos uh, gave you a, a little dab my first, uh, uh, you know, first time in 10 months having ingested anything. And uh, I managed to drive home and I forgot my keys at Carlos's house. And it's still a mystery. Well, then how did I drive home? <laughs> I can almost I, I make that akin to the Turks who were feeding the Holocaust victims as they got out of the camps. Huge, heavy meals. I, it didn't quite work out well for their hunger. I got a serious question for Dr. Vlock, actually. So, like, I, I really appreciate and, and it's something that I feel that the movement's kind of moving away from this whole plant you know, med medical approach that you're bringing to light during our show. I really do appreciate it. Um, and it really is a, the best way to approach cannabis. I have a question, though, uh, between a, a, a difference in balance of cannabinoids. I know that some terpenes have been known to activate uh, cannabinoid receptors. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on how to add terpenes in order to, to bring more of a whole plant approach. The... Uh specific terpene you're talking about is caryophylline, mm -hmm. uh, the active ingredient essentially in black pepper. Uh, there are many different uh, terpenes. And again, terpenes are those things that plants produce that give all plants their smell. The most common one in nature is pine, pine smells. Okay, so pinene. Pinene happens to be, if in Japanese culture, something that is mind awakening. It takes fog away. It allows people to concentrate perhaps without having some of the memory impairments associated with THC. So very often people who want to function at a high level, um, and I think Jack Carrere was a varietal that had a considerable complement of terpene back in the day, um, and also very expensive in those days too, but like sort of a connoisseur's understanding that when you add, in this case, pining, to THC, it tends to mitigate some of that memory impairment, more productive days. It doesn't mean sativa. It just means you're remembering what's going on and actively engaging. Other types, uh, there are, by the way, the only uh, terpene that I know that actually acts as a cannabinoid directly on the receptors is the caryophylline, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily better or worse. There's anti-inflammatory traits with it and the THC itself. But then again, people confuse some of the other terpenes without knowing the subtle ways that they're different. For instance, linoleum, um, lavender, okay? Uh, the, the two different things, linoleum, linoleum. Uh, citrus things like lemon, lime, lino, um, impart sort of a feeling of cleanliness and fresh and go down the grocery aisle and smell all the detergents. You'll, you'll know how <laughs> smells uh, impact with your brain. Or go on a flight where if you're in first class and they hand you one of those you know, warm, moist, or hot towels with it's all like lemon. Could be the dirtiest thing you're using. You'd never know, but it gives you the impression it's clean. As compared to um, linalool, lavender. Lavender is a fascinating plant. Lavender, of course. Um, uh, well, I mean, to give you one exep example of what lavender oil does, if you've never gotten a little bottle of it, you should. And it has nothing to do with what it smells like. Keep it in your kitchen. It is a wonderful treatment topically for burns. Kitchen burns has happened, has even happened just yesterday to my wife. She 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 had a burn, and that's what happens in kitchens. Put a little lavender on it that is something you expect. Oh, my God, that's going to be a blister and hurt. Watch what happens. It's kind of amazing, but that's not an old wives' tale. This is actually how certain extractions of things have been used for ages. So lavender oil. But lavender is also used a lot in bath bathrooms and soaps, things like that, in the steamy shower, because it's relaxing, okay? And, and to a certain extent, calming. Relaxing and calming and even sedating is different than yet another terpene, which is likely the dominant terpene in almost all the varieties you'll see in the shops today, which is called myrcene. Myrcene, while it's found in mangoes, myrcene is also genetically the one terpene that I cited in that other slide where it came from Afghani Kush. And myrcene is not relaxing, sedating, or calming. It's actually hypnotic. And so the same way that I said pinene can help memory in a sense or help offset THC's impact on it, myrcene 
can accentuate the memory impairment associated with THC. It tends to be hypnotic, meaning a wall goes up. Um, so th that's a little brief synopsis on several different terpenes. Look at the label, read the label. Hopefully it reflects actually what's in the plant. Hopefully for clinicians and patients alike, if reporting is responsibly done for things taken for medical purposes, list on the ingredients what's actually in it beyond THC and CBD. I'd like to see CBG listed perhaps in the future, but for terpenes, at least I gave you a good four there to start with to give you the predominant ones I see as being important because we already know about how they work. Take advantage of them. Is there a difference in efficacy between the naturally occurring extracted terpenes and the food grade terpenes being added to certain uh, uh, products out there in, uh, in Florida here right now? A good question. Um, I don't know if anybody truly knows it, but those food grade additive terpenes are basically manufactured as petroleum distillates. I'm not sure how helpful or healthy it is to inhale those. So um, on, on the basis of is... I don't, I don't want is to an apple, an apple. I generally sniff gasoline, so I don't know. But remember where they're being made. Obviously, I said all plants produce terpenes, and so you have several plants that you can derive these from. I gave you examples of some of those plants a few moments ago. But in the cannabis plant, the very same structures that produce the cannabinoids, the THC and the CBD, are also where the production of these terpenes are taking place. They're trichomes, capate glandular trichomes, and they're coming out collectively with the cannabinoids as oils. Only once you extract and separate are you essentially dismantling the evolved plant. And who does the plant evolve along with? Human beings. Yeah, the doc. I was reading. I was reading your blog, and that was one of the the interesting things I found. You you talk about not just uh, cannabis, but you talked about opium, cocaine, tobacco, coffee, and chocolate as these you know various plants that human beings have cultivated, and and you know they've evolved alongside us in many ways over the past twelve thousand years. And if you don't think that coffee and chocolate that I grow in my backyard here are addictive. My belly would, would think otherwise, at least for the chocolate, the coffee I have every morning, you know. So, but the point is that I wanted to get into because of the limited time we have, guys, is I think it's a very important conversation to sort of wrap it up with potency because the plant has evolved to becoming more and more potent. We said, whether through natural or unnatural selection, the modern plant is many fold more potent than it was in 1970. And when you look at the research that was done on the cannabis plant, let's say from 1970 to 1999, why am I saying roughly then? Well, think about it as the millennia once, but that was the Institute of Medicine's first report, real scientific report after the mechanism for how it was used was learned. That report was complemented by the National Academies report in 2017. And what's happened during those years and since 2017 is the plant's becoming ever more concentrated and concentrates are coming out. So what's the important about what's important about potency? Anything, anything, water and oxygen too much can not just hurt you, can actually kill you. Did you know you can actually die from water intoxication and that too much oxygen can impact problems to parts of the body, particularly the eyes? Uh, there is a a person named Paracelsus, 1493 through 1541 is when he lived, okay? He's credited as being the father of modern toxicology. And there's a basic maxim all pharmacologists know. And I'm going to quote, it's only the dose that differentiates the drug from the poison. And so it describes then how a substance can produce harmful effects associated with its toxic properties to a susceptible biological system within the body in a high enough concentration. All chemicals can have that if too much is eaten, drunk, or absorbed. And, and so I wanted to bring it up because the research that everyone's relying on about cannabis, what it works for, are largely showing that it takes very small amounts to have beneficial effects for things like the muscle spasms for multiple sclerosis, nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy, epilepsy and refractory seizures, and here's the catch-all, chronic pain. There is substantial or conclusive proof for those four items 
that came out of the National Academy's report, but they're commenting on testing things that are relatively weak and impotent. We don't know what these new concentrations do with the total amount that people have been consuming for the last several years. And so it just brings back into the basis of what sometimes is summarized in the statement, sometimes the dose defines the poison. And I'm not saying it's a poison, but be cautious when you say that it works for this, that, and the other, and yet the medicine that's being accessed is not that same medicine that's been researched. It's considerably more potent. So should people have this? Yeah. But how much less of whole flour are you going to have? What are you going to do with, with one bud? Are you going to take something and split it into 20 little pieces, 40 little pieces? See how much in one concentrated bud of 20% THC you get nowadays when you take out something and it's half the size of a pencil eraser. And you'd be very surprised with how much total THC is in that little aliquot, that little portion. So are you insinuating uh, that when people try to sell their products based right. on the concentration of THC, they're actually not selling a medicinal product. They're actually selling a more adult use product. I did not say that. I said that the product that they're selling doesn't have the benefit of the research that they mm -hmm. are providing that goes along with that sale. And I, and I get what you're saying too, Doc. There's nothing to, to test really. You know, a popcorn bud could actually have more THC in it than some of these big fluffy ones right you know I, I gotta tell you dr block i'm sitting here and i i'm listening to what you're saying and it like a big part of me is like scared shitless and it's not because i do so many dabs but <laughs> it's because of, from what i know about dosage with cannabis and you're you're literally sitting there saying the dose is the put the you could be you know poison you know it might be a little bit you know more dramatic than you know a taking arsenic or something like that but um anyways to get to my point <laughs> no I, I mean everybody's got a different dose with this stuff you know i've known people that need a, a a huge dose you know to 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 newbie this dose would be poisonous so how can we like you know uh standardize this how can we make this more medical what 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 is your your approach to because you're 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 essentially uh bringing bringing to us a problem what is your solution well um thank you for asking it bluntly like that yeah <laughs> uh, first of all i'll tell you what my motivation is after i tell you about the standards you, you should have standards if you want to know where the standards are we touched on it briefly two weeks ago the united states pharmacopoeia quite expectedly in the future is likely to say that there are really three forms of cannabis those that feature thc those that feature approximately one-to-ones and those that feature cbd and they've been designated as such in the paper by Mahmoud El Sole uh, et al, included several USP contributors. But those three groupings will likely be the way that things are standardized, each within its own little domain. So let's feature those one-to-ones a moment, because there's probably the most therapeutic potential, in my opinion, with those. And the point is that the potency does matter. Carlos, what affects you and dabs or other concentrations would be something rudely um, uh, received by, say, a first-time novice user or an older person if they were to try that. I don't know how old you are, but we, we I can tell you that you. I am the father of kids who are half your, less than half your age. I got twin 16-year-old little boys here in high school, going back to high school. And I want to teach them that they should be not only responsible, but what's out there. And if they don't have any idea with truly what's in it and how to approach it, baby doses first. And they're not baby size kids. These are 16 year olds that they're all bigger and taller than me and stronger. But my apprehension then with the modern hybrids potency isn't only because I'm a physician, it's because I'm a father. And I yet have to recognize that my kids are gonna grow up in a society that includes cannabis as commercial legalization within a for-profit industry. So their mother and I are going to responsibly teach our kids, as we do with all medicines, not so much the dose makes the poison and have them fearful of the word poison, but I want them to know that as they experiment with life's temptations, hopefully they'll learn to navigate their youthful enthusiasm with thoughtful moderation. And I think all patients can do that as they delve into this, whether they're an old familiar, you know, stoner from the 60s, is still alive, but 
in this case, we've got a whole new generation of people growing up in what is a legal environment, not just in Florida, but likely in the country and hence the world in the next few years to come. Carlos, it didn't happen this year. Chris didn't happen this year, but um, it's on a path and that timeline from what went into prohibition from 1911 or so to 37, those 26 years, when you add 26 years to 1996, cannabis first legalization state being California, you get 2022. Is that something that gives you sort of an optimism for just wait till next year? That's what lobbyists do. If they fail one year, just wait till next year. And they kick the ball down the, down the field a little longer. Uh, but look, there's a bright future ahead. The more we learn about it, the, long, the more we learn to work within what the reality of the modern plant is, the more you realize you have to base your research and conclusions on what is actually being used, not what the books say was used 20 years ago. Now, if, if anybody still listens to Kevin Sabet, not one of my favorite people, but uh, he represents a lot of the drug industry in, in, in the way that he speaks, where he's basically saying you take the plant, pull apart all of its parts, synthesize them, and put it into a, into a pill with a one-size-fits-all dosage, and then it becomes medical. And uh, I find that to be kind of almost uh, insulting, but uh, because I don't think he really understands the plant when he, when he talks about how you manufacture it. That, that, yeah, that is how you manufacture some drugs, but not necessarily cannabis, which is, that needs to be titrated towards the individual person with an individual strain from a naturally based balance. And this week, uh, Pfizer mentioned the fact that they are now working on cannabinoid research. And I'm wondering where Pfizer is going to go with this. Any idea? Yeah, Pfizer's big pharma. The difference between what Kevin Sabet is saying, and I'm not vilifying Kevin Sabet in this, his analysis actually is probably I'll do it for you. correct. No, well, <laughs> forget about the politics a minute. That's think about job, the context. <laughs> think about the context in which he's speaking. He's speaking in the context of big pharma and the 1970 Controlled Substance Act defining which is not only prohibited, but what controls exist are all big pharma models. The 1970 Controlled Substance Act is based on a concept of big pharma that is one molecule for a drug development to treat one disease that gets one patent. That's big pharma. The reason that 1970 evolved to that and the reason that plant-derived chemicals, as far as medicines, fell out of favor is for exactly the reason we're kind of still stuck. They're hard to standardize. And because of the challenges with standardizing it, coupled with the political influences, botanical medicines generally fell out of favor throughout the, the 19th into the 20th century, certainly by mid 20th century under its prohibition. By the time 1970 comes along, there goes the Controlled Substance Act following a big pharma model which was not consistent with botanical medicines because of the challenges of standardizing them. Those challenges exist today. You want to take the component parts, put them back together. It's sort of a hybrid model then between big pharma and botanical medicines. I do see that as, as at least the initial pathway that's most likely to follow. Well, the thing that gives me promise, Doc, is people like yourself, uh, people like Dr. Mishulam, uh, you know, we had uh, Dr. Barry Gordon on last week. And just understanding that, you know, uh, we were talking about how we got to prohibition, how California outlawed it initially. And that was uh, because, you know, Harry, Henry J. Finger, who was one of California's um, uh, appointees to the State Board of Pharmacy, uh, helped push those initial uh, poison control laws in, in, can, in, you know, uh, in, in California around cannabis. And so seeing that uh, politics, doctors, pharmacists uh, were our origins of this seeing doctors like yourself actually pointing to actual real research, doing the hard research um, is, is important, I think, moving forward. And, uh, and for us as a activists and advocates, we do have a political slant, just like the prohibitionists do. But I'm glad that we've had you on the show um, over the past few weeks because it has grounded us in understanding that it's not always about the politics. We, we got into this uh, and founded this chapter, Carlos and myself, because we cared about patients. And, and caring about sick people, you know, um, sometimes we, we have to understand that uh, the politics does need to take a back seat. But at the same time, when there's people dying, when your loved ones are sick, uh, all you can see is is the political roadblocks in front of you sometimes. So we really hey, appreciate you bringing the clinician's point of view. Yeah, would, you guys like like, would you guys like to show one last slide as we sign off that gives you going back from where we started to public health? 
it's actually an important understanding that cannabis is not the only issue. Neither are opioids. I, I, can you share my screen one last time? Yep, it's up there, Doc. Um, All right. This is a slide showing the leading causes of preventable deaths throughout the United States. And I'm showing you a trend from 2004 until 2019 because I wanted to point out that over those years, if you look all the way to the right where drug abuse was, was at the ninth leading cause of preventable death, opioids, 2004. 2019, just 15 years later, it jumps up to be one, two, three, four, five, the sixth leading cause, more common than motor vehicle collisions or firearms. Wow. You know, what do you hear about car accidents and firearm deaths? All the changes in motor vehicles, number one, contributed to the changes. Firearm deaths, you hear a lot about that. But that change of those 15 years coincides with a public health victory. And that's where I want you to look at tobacco a moment. By far the leading cause of preventable death globally. And during those same 15 years, tobacco smoking has gone considerably down. That's a public health victory. I'm sharing it with you because there are good things that happen from when you look at this from the purview of what's in the best interest of public health. And the fact is that this is the big picture. This is where cannabis fits in. After overweight and obesity, look, there's alcohol. Infectious diseases, in fact, may jump up. It's a little close to alcohol. I'm curious to see where the next rendition of this slide evolves with how COVID's impacted things. But make no doubt about it. Opioids versus cannabinoids, they are two totally different plants, totally different outcomes for death, preventable death. And that's why I wanted to conclude with this the same way we started with public health. We're wrapping it up that way. Excellent, excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, thank you is in order. We have to have you on because I got a whole bunch of questions because you got to come <laughs> on again. I don't know if you mind, but uh, you got to come on again because I I've got I've got more things to ask. <laughs> now we, we should mention that next week we are taking a little bit different tact, and we are going to have as our guest uh, Randy Lanier, who is a, uh, a NASCAR driver uh, who was. Uh, Imprisoned for several decades for a, a non-violent offense, of course, which is involved, being involved in cannabis. And we will get a chance to take a look at the legal end and the legal implications of uh, the war on drugs and prohibition. And also, we should mention that since we're talking about politics, we do have our, our Suntoast Normal Lobby Days, which we're doing in conjunction with Tampa, I mean, we have the Tallahassee <laughs> Normal, <laughs> whatever, it starts with T. Tampa. Yeah, we're in a Tallahassee normal, and that will be the uh, 12th and 13th of January. We'll be giving you more information in regards to housing, and uh, we do want you to go ahead and RSVP so that you can talk directly to your own legislator when you're up there. So go ahead, go go to our, our website, suncoastnormal.org, and get all the information. And it's Dr. The- Block, just take, take a moment to tell people where they can find you and, and all the things that you do. Well, um there's a website, nurturingnature.com. Uh, you can find out more about what the, the consultancy does. Also find a little more about uh, myself as a plantsman. And uh, hopefully people will engage that way. I'll try to keep links, of course, to go to the different blogs that I contribute to. And uh, we can keep things current. And Bye, everybody. Yeah. Don't forget, Christmas is coming, but you can't gift cannabis. 